How many of you were here when Swoop Brown and his team led worship? Thank you so much. So at the second service, Gabriel shared briefly, I think four minutes, five minutes, his uh, testimony. And I'm just sitting there thinking, well, we've got we've to ha have him out for Ren the Heavens and, and uh, hear the full story um, because it's so impactful. And we love what God does in the life of, 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 minister, of, of even in prisons. Uh, many of you know we just uploaded our sermons now to Pando. I don't know if you know what Pando is. It's one of the only apps that is allowed in the correctional facilities in the United States. And I just checked yesterday, and in six months, there's been 165,000 views of the sermons from here. So, so God, we love reaching the prisons. I mean, I don't know how many salvations. I think they clicked like five or 600, 700 salvations uh, just from that. And, and just, uh, we're getting letters now uh, from prisoners, so um, I'm going to announce this Sunday. But if you feel called to respond to them and maybe be a point person, that would that would help because we're starting to get a lot more letters in from from all the different correctional facilities, and that would be helpful. So, Swoop Brown, introduce Gabriel, and we'll take it from there. All right, thanks, Pastor. Y'all have a great pastor. I think you already know that, but I just have to say that. So, I, I won't. I won't. I'm not going to hog the mic. I just want to talk about this uh, gentleman that's getting ready to come up here. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to worship with him. I've come all the way in from Bakersfield because we've been driving around uh, going up to Teen Challenge up in Bakersfield. But it is an honor to uh, introduce uh, Gabriel. Uh, I, I met him through uh, Teen Challenge and then over at TCMI where we connected musically. And it's just, I, I can't say there's nothing that I can say that it's just a blessing to be uh, not only around him, but watch him and listen to his testimony because his testimony is, is huge. It's, 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 what's the word? It's awesome. How about that? Because God is awesome, right? So, like I said, I don't want to hog it up because I'll ramble and ramble and ramble because that's what worship leaders do. And uh, so I just want to introduce my brother and my, my friend, uh, Gabriel Espinosa. So, uh, you hear me? So my name is Gabriel Espinosa Jr. I am 39 years old. I'm from Shafter, California. Um, grew up there my whole life, lived there my whole life. And so back in the 90s, we lived on a street called Nickel Street. It was in the lower class neighborhood. It's a bunch of track apartments on one block surrounded by a bunch of lower class housing. And I grew up in that neighborhood. That neighborhood was infested by gangs. If you've ever seen a movie about the 90s, like in LA, how everybody's outside, imagine a bunch of Mexicans doing that. That's, that's, that's what it was. It was everybody outside all day, every day, hanging out and run, running around the neighborhood. Now my father is from that same neighborhood that I used to be from. So he grew up there, was a gang member. And when he was a young man, he decided that he was done with that life and was gonna turn his life over to Christ. And so he be, quickly became like a youth leader at the church. And then when I was 10 years old, he was the youth pastor at the church. I remember that. And my dad was going to be 30. His brother's a year younger than him. Him and his brother were really close. And his brother got murdered in our neighborhood uh, through gang violence and gun violence from the same guys that, uh, from that neighborhood that we're from. His brother got murdered there. And I remember that, that kind of like did something like shifted my mind and it did something really tragic to my family. It's the type of thing that, that you really don't ever get over. You kind of get through it. I remember being 10 years old and seeing my dad kind of on this, on this fence of, well, well, what do I do? Because I say I'm a Christian and I say I serve God, but this happened to my family in the neighborhood where I'm from, from these guys that I used to hang out with. And I saw my dad turn his back on everything and follow God all the way. And being a kid who grew up in that neighborhood and you hear things and people say things and a lot of my friends in that neighborhood had older brothers because they didn't have dads. And the talk was, you know, was like, that, that's not what you're supposed to do. Like, that's not what you're supposed to do. You, you know, you need to do something about that. So for about the next five years, we lived hearing about this over and over. When I was in eighth grade, we moved across town. And it was a totally different neighborhood. There was a, it was really nice, really quiet. My parents bought a house. It was the first time I had my own room. And the kids in that neighborhood were a lot different than the kids that I, I grew up hanging out with. But me, every day after school, I would walk to that neighborhood and hang out there and then go home. 
I, I kind of already had my mind made up about what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be. When I was in high school, as a freshman in high school, my dad planted a church. And so he became a pastor when I was a freshman in high school. And so in our house, it was God first, family second, then it was school and sports. And there was no room for anything else. So when I was in my late teens, I left the house because I was already hanging out in the neighborhood and I was a gang member. And I, I do this illustration because I get to talk in high schools, but um, every time that I, that I would lie about where I was going to be, or I showed up late, or I disrespected my parents, or I made a bad decision, I was moving in a direction that, that I, didn't, I didn't know. Like, like, I paint a picture all the time. I, I always talk about, like, uh, when I was lost on drugs, like an imaginary box over here. Like, if I, when I was sitting in the orchard, and I'll get to that in a minute, but I was getting ready to kill myself and all those things. And then there's a box over here, and there's a guy who serves in church and does worship and has a family. And in the middle, there's, there's a high school kid with his whole life ahead of him. And you tell the kid to pick one. He's obviously always going to pick the good one, right? And then I break down what my family dynamic looks like. And so how do I fit into that equation? And how did I get over there? And it was every time I lied, every time I showed up late, every time I stole something, every time I disrespected my parents, when I tried alcohol for the first time and I smoked weed, then I tried cocaine, and then I'm 19 years old and I'm at a party with these guys who are gang members from my neighborhood and one of them's little brother has a gun and he shoots another kid and I get arrested for the first time for a serious crime. You know, and any normal kid, I think that would have opened his eyes and said, get away from this as fast as you can. But like any, I'll put it like this, anybody who's in this room who's an athlete or ever played a sport, then you know that if you mess up in practice, coach makes you do it again so you can get it right in the game. So essentially, I was getting it wrong in practice and getting it wrong in practice and getting it wrong in practice. And when the game happened, I got it wrong in the game. So I didn't turn around and say, let me get away from this. I actually thought that it was cool. And because now I'm known in the neighborhood, we're known because we shot we, because that's, I was in that group. We shot a kid and we did all this gang stuff. And so when I was 19 years old, my dad bailed me out of jail. And that was pretty much the last time that we Actually, we're all moving down the same path. After that, I was a known gang member. I started selling meth. I got into a relationship. I was in a 10-year relationship with a girl whose family was all gang members, and they sold meth. My parents would come to my house because by the world standard, I was successful. I had a really good job, but I lived a double life. I had a really good job working in the, in the industry where I sold uh, heavy equipment and parts. And then I was a gang member who sold meth on the other side of it. So my parents would come over, my dad would knock on the door, talk to me from the front door. My mom would never get out of the car and come into my house because she knew what we were doing there. So for, for 10 years, I did this until I, my Mercedes, I had a Mercedes Benz, it got shot up by some guys who wanted to kill me. My small circle of friends, I had about four or five people. Two of them got murdered in the same year. The other one got shot and then they shot up my Mercedes. I lost my job, I ruined the relationship I had, and I stopped going to work. And once I stopped going to work, the smoking meth and hiding it was just full out meth addiction. My house was known as a gang house. People were in and out of my house, and if, if you had money or you had drugs, my house was the place to be. It went from um, smoking meth and getting high to it being a chore. And being to the, that was the thing that really controlled my whole life. It controlled what kind of friends I had. It controlled the women I dated. It controlled the places I went. It was just a full-blown meth addiction. In uh, 2015, I started getting arrested because of the guys around me that had gotten murdered. The cops were questioning a lot of people. My name was thrown into that thing a lot of times. And so the cops raided my house and I got arrested. I didn't know that God uses cops. I didn't know that that, was, that that was a good thing. And it'll make sense in a minute. But I started getting arrested and I was in and out of jail for about a year. And I never reported to felony probation because I got charged with a felony. I'm a felon. So this last time I get caught, I'm on my way to prison. It's the beginning of 2016. And probation comes back and says, well, you never check in but we want to do something for you. We want to see if we can get you a program. And I'm like, oh, that, that, what does that look like? They said, it's a one-year program. I said, I can do one year standing on my head. Anywhere. 
uh, rather than being in prison. That's easy. I'll do a program. So I, I got sentenced. I did 72 days, and my dad picked me up from the jail, and uh, we went to probation. I finally checked in. They gave me a list of all these programs, and at, at the top of the list is all these programs that cost money, and at the bottom of the list, there's these free programs, and the lady had circled Teen Challenge. Now, I'm from Shafter. Teen Challenge is in Shafter, so we know about those crazy guys. Okay, they come, they're loud, they're yelling, they're in the front worshiping, and they drink all the coffee and eat all the donuts. Okay, so I know about these guys, and I know what that's about. My dad had done work with the Teen Challenge in Shafter. They went over there and played softball games. They helped out the guys with work calls. Uh, Teen Challenge would come to the church, all kinds of stuff. So I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to Teen Challenge. And my dad says, well, you don't have any money. This is, it's in Shafter. It's all good. So I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. And so I went to Teen Challenge. Now, while I'm in Teen Challenge, I start to meet all these people that don't look like me. And they didn't come from where I came from. They're not the same age as me. But these guys had like something different. It, it just was a different feel there. It was something I think I'd been looking for my whole life. This was October 12th. It was a Wednesday night, October 12th, 2016. I checked in the doors of Chapter 10 Challenge. And it was the first time that I had ever gotten alone. And I wasn't high. And I wasn't drunk. And somebody was doing my laundry who wasn't my mom and my bills are all paid for, and my meals are being cooked, and all I have to do is get up in the morning and, and follow the schedule. And so I used to sit at the back on, the, on the, that side of the chapel because the door to the chapel is right there, so I could be the last one in and the first one out. And eventually, I ended up making my way to the front of the chapel because God was doing something in my life. Like, I, I knew what it was because I, grown, I grew up in it, but I didn't know how to explain it. And I didn't know how to pray. So they do 30 minutes of prayer in the morning, and I would fall asleep most of the time. But I would sit there and think about, just think about my life. And I remember the first song that I ever actually learned how to sing was Greater You, Lord. And so not knowing how to pray, singing these songs began the way that I would communicate with God. Because I knew that when I was saying the words that I was saying, that it meant something to me. That, 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 that I was looking back on everything that I had been through and I could see where God was, was kind of, he had been there the whole time, right? And so I didn't really learn how to pray, but I learned how to like sing these songs and them to mean something in my mind. So I move on from Shafter to the castle in Riverside and I become a, a that's my son, and I become a, a van leader for fundraising. I, I found out that I have a talent to go and to talk to people and to lead uh, groups of men. So I became a van leader for fundraising and, and we would go out to the communities and we'd tell people about Teen Challenge and ask them to support the ministry. And then uh, I realized also that on Sundays, you can get off campus if you join choir. <laughs> and so if I'm a fundraiser, I'm off campus four days a week already. And if I join choir, that means I'm off campus five days a week. I only have to be on campus the two days that we have class. And there's not really work going on that day, so it's a score, right? So I start living my life like I used to. I mean, I, I wasn't on drugs, but I was listening to secular music. I was, I was pretty much getting all the guys in the van with me to listen to secular music. I would manipulate the guys and manipulate the list and take only the guys who were like ex-gang members and guys that I thought were cool to get on my list to go fundraising. I was going, because you can't have coffee there, I was going to the dollar store and buying uh, instant coffee and hiding it. You know, if we were fundraising, I made a lot of money, I would take money out of my pouch and buy myself food. I was doing all these things that, that I used to do, but it was under the, well, I'm sober, it's okay. So really, the outside was looking like, the, my behavior was changing, but nothing real was going on on the inside. But God was really working on me this whole time. So I started going on choirs. And me being the, the, the person that I am and being facetious, if the, 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 the staff member driving the van would say, who's singing this song? I would say, you know, Joseph. And he would be like, Joseph, you're singing this song? And he'd be like, I'm not singing that song. And I would think it's funny sitting in the back. So I would do it all the time, and I finally got caught. Well, I got told on, okay? 
Like, Who said that? And they all pointed at me, you know, they, Gabriel said it. So I was given this ultimatum by my advisor who took us on choir. Either you're going to sing one of the solos or you're not going to come no more and you're going to be in trouble. And so I never sang in my life. So I said, okay, um, I know the words to Chainbreaker, and that's one of the songs we sing, so I'm going to have to sing Chainbreaker because I don't want to get in trouble. If I get kicked out of this program, I'm looking at three years in prison. I can't, you know, I can't do that, so I'm going to sing this song. And I remember there was a couple of guys um, who were on the worship team that were in the choir with us, and they said, look, if you're going to sing the song, just sing it as hard as you can, man. Otherwise, you're going to sound dumb. <laughs> you know, and my wife always tells me, like, if you're singing the song and you're trying to sound a certain way because you think you sound dumb in your head, then you sound dumb. <laughs> and I say, okay. I said, okay. you know, she tells me that's all, it's true. So I'm like, all right, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I know that I'm singing Chainbreaker first, so I'm just going to go all out. So I sang Chainbreaker. And when I finished, the church stood up and they were cheering. And so I'm like, okay, that, that worked. I'm not going to be in trouble. And when we got off stage, some of the guys that were on the worship team that were on choir were like, hey, you need to join the worship team. And so I was like, oh, I'll join the worship team. Cool, because that means on Sundays, you know, I don't have to come to choir no more. I can join the worship team and stand on the side in the back and sing my part real low and nobody will pay attention. So I joined the worship team. It was the first time I ever sang in my life, and I joined the worship team, and I got to sing for a couple of months. So I get through the program, and I graduate. It's October 17th, 2017. I graduate. And I really felt like God had done work in my life, and I know that I was changing and I didn't want to go home. I was scared. I was scared because I knew that inside my heart there was stuff going on that I still wanted to do. I had that 10-year relationship that I wanted to go home and fix. I had bought a house. I needed to go home and work and pay the bills. There was all this stuff that I had to come back to. I had to go back to Shafter too, right? And so... You ever read the story of David and Goliath? You, you know that part when David says, I'm, I'm going to fight him, right? And, and King Saul puts the armor on David, and he says, I can't move. Was Saul wrong? No, a boy's going to go fight, put armor on him. Like, it's not a wrong thing to do. But David, being about his father's business, serving his brothers, knew that it just wasn't right. So... Can you see the two points of views that I'm looking at this thing from? Like, I know that God's calling me to stay in Teen Challenge and wants me to move on and do ministry, but I also know that I got to go home and pay bills and fix the things that I messed up. So I was justifying going home. But after having a conversation with my parents, I decided to stick around Teen Challenge. Now, when you graduate from Teen Challenge, they offer an apprenticeship. That means you stick, on, stick around for four extra months you work underneath staff, you're a student leader. So I decided I would do that. That I didn't know what to do yet. So I decided I would do that. So I started that in October. We went October, November, and December. And by December, I'm, I'm pretty much over it. You know, I'm pretty much walking in pride because I'm answering staff emails. I'm making all these lists. I'm sending out fundraisers. I'm doing everything for Teen Challenge, okay? In my mind, Teen Challenge didn't start in 1969 here in California. It started in 2016 when I got there. And it wasn't going to go on without me, okay? Many students from Teen Challenge, they get this mentality. You weren't doing this before I got here, and you're not going to... Yes, yes, they were, okay? As a worship leader, I know this. There was worship before me, and there's going to be worship after me. Thank God I get to worship, okay? But as a, as a, as a, in Teen Challenge, I was thinking that. And so I'd been breaking the rules all year. Well, I had a cell phone. You're not supposed to have a cell phone. So on New Year's Eve, we take the guys out to a church called Harvest Church, and they have this festival. It says New Year's Eve, 2000, the end of 2017. Well, I'm standing there, and I got my phone out, and I buy myself an Amtrak ticket. I'm going home tomorrow. And so I'm standing on the curb of the church. I'm looking out to the street, and I said, I'm going home tomorrow. And I look to my left, and there's a liquor store. So I walked to the liquor store, and I bought a bottle. And I went back about four times. And I got drunk. When we got back to campus that night, I left campus because I knew some guys that got kicked out of the program who were in Riverside. And I called them, they picked me up, and I went out that night and I got high. So when I came back to campus on New Year's Day, I was hungover and burnt out. That means I had a rough night. So I got on the Amtrak and I went home. 
And when my dad picked me up from the Amtrak, he didn't know what happened. He, but he hugged me and he said, I'm proud of you. And I like melted because he didn't, he didn't know what I had just done. So now I'm home and I'm living a lie. So I stay on the couch at my mom's for about a week and I go back and I get my old job back. So I get my old job back, I got a new car, I got a new girlfriend, and everything's gonna be fine. But I pretty much shut down everything that I learned in Teen Challenge. So I'm not going to church, I'm not praying, I'm not reading my Bible, and I'm definitely not surrounded by community. But I had people from Teen Challenge keep reaching out to me and telling me I need to go back and I need to, to finish what I started. Very quickly I fell back into meth addiction and started hanging out with the old gang member friends. And so for a year and a half, I was using needles and I was running around with a gun and people I was with were getting killed and, and arrested for serious things and I kept just getting out by the skin of my teeth. And so I got to a point that none of these guys wanted to hang out with me anymore because I was like tr tripping on them. I was doing things that were out of the ordinary. I was seeing things and hearing things and I'll, I'll put it like this. There's nothing worse than when you get filled by the Holy Spirit and God calls you and you walk away. That whole God turning his back and separating himself from you and turning you over to your sin, I know what that feels like. Some people call it psychosis. I call it being open spiritually to the wrong things. I decided that I needed help and I wanted to change, so I went with my parents to church on a Sunday morning. And I'm standing Sunday morning with my back against the wall in church and I could hear these voices telling me, you need to get out of here, and you need to get out of here now. Audible voices were telling me, get out of here now. So I took off from the church, and my sister went and picked me up, and I told her, drive me into Shafter. So she drove me into town, and I told her, keep driving. And we got to the middle of town, and I jumped out of the car. And I told her, you know, I told her, just do, do whatever you're gonna do. And I walked through town, and I walked out into the orchard, and when I got to the middle of the orchard, the voices stopped. And that's when I realized at that moment, like, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and end my life right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and, and this is gonna be it. So I took my belt off, and I put it around the tree branch and I sat on the floor and I cried for about an hour. And it was in that moment I realized how tough I'm not. I know that I didn't wanna live the way that I was living. I know that I, wanted to stop getting high, but I couldn't. But I also know I wasn't as tough as I thought because there's no way I was gonna kill myself. And that was the first time besides singing out loud that I actually prayed. I looked up in the sky and I just said, where are you? Do you not see what's going on? I need you to do something and do it now. And I felt in my heart, God tell me, you need to get up and go to your mom and dad's. So I got up and I walked across town to my mom and dad's and I walked in the house and I think they had been looking for me and everybody was calling to see where I was. And so my dad followed me to the room and I, and I, and I just kind of collapsed on the floor and I was crying. And he asked, what, what's wrong? And I said, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm losing it and, uh, and I'm about to kill myself and I need you to be a dad. I haven't lived with you since I was a teenager. I need you to tell me how do I fix the relationships I've messed up? How do I do... And I just rambled on of all these things that I wanted fixed. And he, uh, he picked up the Bible. And I slapped the Bible out of his hand. And I told him, I hate that you're a pastor and I hate that you're a Christian. Because you think you can fix everything with that book. And, uh, and he pulled out his car keys and credit card. And he handed it to me. And he picked the Bible up and he said, go ahead. You can have all the money. You can take the car. You can do whatever you want. But this is the only thing that's going to fix you. This is the only thing that's gonna sustain you. This is the only thing worth living for. And I, I broke down, because I knew that what I had set out in the orchard, that that was the answer to it. So I went to sleep that day, and I woke up a couple of days later, and I got on the phone with John Burns at Reedley T. Challenge. And I told John Burns what had been going on, and he said, he, this was like on a Thursday, he said, can you get here Monday? I said, well, I think I need about a week. He said, no, 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 you need help? You need to get here Monday. Go get your physical and get everything done and get here on Monday. So I got there on Wednesday. I, I, you know, I, I went out and got high that Friday night one last time. And so when I went to go take my TB test, I, I, didn't, I didn't show up to do it. So I ended up going that Monday. 
And, uh, and when we were leaving the doctor's office, I remember I was like trying to have like second thoughts about it. And I told my dad, well, you know, uh, we got to go to the house so I can get my, my bag. You know, I got to get my bag. He said, your bag's in the car. I said, okay. Um, well, I want to eat at this place right here. It opens at 10 a.m. He said, no, no, we're going to eat on the road. I said, okay. So he had answers for everything, right? So we drive, we drive, and we get off in this place called Delano, and it's, it's like on the border of Tulare and, and Kern County. And, uh, and I said, let me use your phone. He said, okay. So I go, out, I go out, of the, out of the place we're eating, and I'm on his phone. I'm trying to call my friends to pick me up. And as I'm making a phone call, this car pulls in with these guys, and they're from a, a rival gang. And they pull in the, in the parking lot, so I turned around and went back inside. And my dad says, I told you to stay inside. I said, I know. So I said, well, th well that, that part's not going to work. So then we're driving to Reedley, and if you've ever been to Reedley Teen Challenge, it's kind of in the middle of a field. So the, there's small little dirt roads, and I got my hand on the, on the, on the, on the, yeah, the door handle. And every time my dad slows down to turn, he's looking at me, and I'm like, I'm getting ready to jump out. I figure I could jump out. I can act crazy like I've been acting. He could call the cops, or we can go home. One way or the other, I'm not going back to Teen Challenge because I know what that means. But uh, I didn't jump out of the truck. And we're driving down the road. There's a bunch of orchards. And then there's not. And you can tell there's not. And as we pass the orchards, I see the Teen Challenge. And I felt this peace. This, like, this peace fall over me. And so I walk in the doors. And a man named Mike Jones checks me in. I go to the four-man room. And, and, uh, and all the, the noise kind of goes away. And so for three months, I struggled. For three months, I struggled at Reed Lee Teen Challenge. For three months, I was dealing with my anger, with the racism that I had picked up being locked up. I was dealing with unforgiveness, and I didn't want to anymore. And my friend, Josh DeVera, the other guy that sings with us on the worship team, if you've ever seen him, he was wearing the sweatpants, Josh DeVera gets hired there. And so Josh DeVera pulls me in and says, you're going to be the worship leader here, because I know you can sing. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be the worship leader here because I'm about to go home. He says, no, you're going to be the worship leader here. And two things very interesting happened at Reed Lee Team Challenge. The first one is I was, we were sitting, we were doing this week of prayer. I was sitting there and had worship music on, and this thing kept coming up in my mind of when my friend got killed. And I said, well, God, you said you forgive me for everything that happened then. Why bring this up? And God reminded me of the time when I was 19 years old after I had gotten arrested that my mom set me down and said, you need to tell me everything that happened so you can be over this because the kid that's walking around here is not my son. And I thought about it and God heard God tell me, I do forgive you. I do know what's going on, but when are you going to sit down and tell me about it? And so I got up and I went and laid face down at the altar and I cried in front of everybody. First time in my life, I cried and I felt those things lift off of me. The next day, another student made me really mad. And so I had decided that when I seen him, I was going to punch him and go home. <laughs> so this is a Friday night, and we have Friday night guest speakers. So I get to the chapel, and, this, and we're all talking and hanging out. I feel a tap on my shoulder, and I turn around. And this guy hugs me, and he says, I love you. And I push him off of me, and I go out of the chapel. And I sit in the kitchen and I'm crying because I'm so mad. How are you going to hug me and say you love me? I'm about to punch you and go home. This is my ticket out of here. I'm about to leave. But this guy, being like Christ, you know, loved on me before I had the chance to even be mad at him. So I'm over in the kitchen. I'm very upset and I'm in tears. And my advisor comes up to me and he says, what's wrong? I said, I want to go home. I'm, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And he said... I hope this makes sense to you. If you leave now, you'll never get back to this place again. And what he meant was, it was going to be life or death at that moment. That God was ready to do something major in my life. And I had the choice to walk in it or walk away. And I chose to stay. And I walked around for about a week with my head down because something died that night. I was mourning the old Gabe. I was literally mourning the old Gabe, and I dove all the way into my word. I spent every morning in the chapel at 5 a.m. after that. 
I led worship every weekend. I did everything that I could. I graduated from restoration because it's restoration. It's only six months if you're already a graduate. I graduated from restoration on December 5th, 2017, or 2019. It was December 5th, 2019. So I had a choice. I can go home and go back to doing what I used to do, or I can go to TCMI. TCMI is the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute. So I decided to go to the TCMI, the Teen Challenge Ministry Institute. Now that was going to start December 27th. So from December 5th to December 27th, I was home. Now, any good thief doesn't find a new way to break into your house. They're always going to come the same way. In those three weeks that I was home, every friend I had called me. There was a, another murder in my neighborhood. There was a funeral where all my friends were at. All these other girls called me. It was everything that could get me to not go to TCMI was coming up at me. Because I already had said I'm going to go. All this stuff was trying to stop me. And I decided I'm not going to go. And one of my friends called me and said, you're giving me a ride there. You better go. And so I went to TCMI. So December 27th was my first day in TCMI. While I was at TCMI, we got locked down for COVID. That was the best thing that ever happened to me. No going off campus, none of that. Worship five days a week. So that means I got to get up two hours earlier than everybody, get to the chapel for sound check, spend some time alone, and then worship in the morning. That is the best thing that ever happened to me. In my first quarter, they do this, we do choir practice on Wednesdays, and then later on a Wednesday, once a month, they have a special choir. Okay? It's called special choir. So I'm like, what is this special choir about? So there's only like half of the students go, and they're all pumped up. So I sneak into the back, okay? I'm in the back of the chapel, and one by one, they're calling them up to go up and try out or do an offering. Either they're reciting a poem, rapping, or singing a song. So I'm like, oh no, I got, I got to get out of here. But before I can leave, her <laughs> stops me at the back door and says, what are you doing here? Okay, if you don't know, that's Bright, that's Swoop's wife. So Bright's got this presence about her, okay? She's confident, she's strong, but she's very loving like a big sister or a mother. So I knew with all my years of authority problems that I was gonna have to just answer her questions. So, so she, she asked me like, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I wanna see what it's about. She says, well, you can't see what it's about. You, you're either gonna join, get on stage, or you gotta go. And, uh, and so I said, all right, I'll get on stage. So I got on stage and I sang a song called Echo by Elevation Worship, and I sang with my friend Bowman. And uh, when I sang the song, I got off stage and Bright pulled me to the side and she said, don't go nowhere because one day you're gonna worship with us. And I thought, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, okay. So, uh, so I, get, I go through TCMI and I graduate. But while I'm at TCMI, um, we went to do the Arise Crusade and so I went to Swoop and Bright's house, and they have a recording studio. So I got up there and I sang a song called Graves to Gardens. And, uh, and he ended up liking the way I sing it. So we did a, a music video for it. And then so I graduate from TCMI. Well, let me get back to it before graduation. So it's, fourth, I, it's third quarter, and in your third quarter, you go to do an internship. So everybody's going to different Teen Challenge centers to do their internship, and I get asked to go to Shafter. Now this is the same Shafter that I'm from the same chapter that I wanted to go back to that I left Teen Challenge for. It's the same place, same thing in my heart. So I go back to chapter for my internship and I, I really enjoy it. When I get back to uh, TCMI for my fourth quarter, all of my friends are getting jobs and not me. And so my friend says, you need to call Oklahoma and, and you need to go to Oklahoma with us. So I call the guy from Oklahoma and he says, I'm gonna offer you a spot. I'm gonna call you Monday. I said, okay. So Monday comes around and I don't get a phone call. So I'm, I'm heartbroken, you know. I really want this. I want to go work with my friends. I, I want to work for Teen Challenge. I don't want to go home with nothing. So uh, as we're driving back home, I get a phone call from a guy named Greg Hill who works at Shafter, and he says, the director of Shafter wants you to call him. So I call him, and he doesn't say anything. He just says, are you ready to come home or not? I said, yes, I'm ready to come home. And so I accept the job at Shafter. So I graduate from TCMI. I go work in Sha at Shafter Teen Challenge. And it's like, um, it's kind of like the Moses thing, I guess. It's like Moses had that thing in his heart stirring up, but in his own strength, he went about it the wrong way. And it wasn't until he took the journey 
and sought the face of God, that he went back with a mission. And that's what I truly believe. That wasn't until I completely took a journey to go seek God's face that I went back with the mission to Shafter. So while I'm working at Shafter, Swoop reaches out to me a couple of times, and I get to go do worship with them. And so I think about the third or fourth time I text him, like, it would be fun, you know, to, to be on your worship team. And he's like, bro, you're already on my team. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm, I'm part of a, a real worship team. So as I'm working in Shafter, I'm getting to go do all this fun stuff. And I'm, I'm part of the worship team now with Swoop and I'm the faithful and everything. And for two years, I prayed that God would bring me a wife. Because in my heart of hearts, I wanted a wife, and I wanted a son, I wanted a family. And we're at this thing called Spiritual Emphasis, and this pastor named Val Farrell walks up to me and says, I know I just met you, and I don't know you, but you're praying for a wife. I said, okay. He says, you don't have a girlfriend. I said, no, I don't have a girlfriend. He says, do you want me to tell you why? I said, why? He says, because you got some areas in your life that are jacked up, and God's not going to give you his daughter to jack her up too. And, and so I said, okay, so what, what does this mean? This means I need to delete Facebook. This means I need to quit flirting over text. This means I need to quit flirting with things that aren't for me, that don't have any future. Because if I'm gonna be a married man, then I need to act like one now. If I'm gonna be a leader of my house, then be one now. I, I couldn't wait to be in a relationship to be faithful. I needed to do it then. So fast forward to a year later, I know my wife because we've had Teen Challenge stints back and forth. I've went twice, she's went twice, and I really like her and I think she's beautiful, but I don't want to be distracted. So we're at Spiritual Emphasis and we're singing and I get off the stage and I'm sitting next to Joseph and I'm telling God, I don't want this to be lust or be a distraction. Lord, help me. Ron Brown's on stage, he's preaching and he stops preaching. He calls all the kids to the front and he starts to prophesy over each kid. And I say, Lord, answer me like that. Slap me in the face with it, because if you give me options, I'm going to mess it up. <laughs> so we get back on stage to close service out. I'm singing. Service ends. I turn around, and it's Val Farrell, who told me last year that I was all jacked up. Okay? So Val Farrell says, hey, Gabe, I'm proud of you. I love the way you worship. Keep doing what you're doing. I said, thank you, Pastor. He walks off. He turns around. He says, oh, yeah. God's preparing your wife. I didn't know that God answered that fast. <laughs> but he did. And so now I'm just, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to walk in it. I remember I ran home. I went to your house and I told you guys about it. I told Joseph about it. I was like in shock that that had actually happened. I had heard of people getting a word from God, but I didn't know that it would ever happen to me. So my wife finishes her apprenticeship and I ask her, if, uh, if we can hang out. And she says, well, we can, but I need to go to L.A. to get my things from my mother's house. I said, well, I'll drive you to L.A. We can hang out there. So we go to L.A., we go to her mom's house, and while she's getting all her stuff, I tell her mom and dad that I'm going to marry their daughter. This is the first time I met them. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so they said, okay. And uh, two weeks later, they came to my mom and dad's house, and I proposed. And a month after that, we got married. That was March 4th, 2023. And so, uh, <laughs> two months later, we find out that we're having a baby. This is, in, uh, this, is in, this is in May in 2023. We find out we're having a baby. And then a month later, uh, we had a miscarriage. And so uh, that was probably the hardest time in my life other than getting over addiction. Because if I'm serving you, Lord, and I'm doing everything you ask, why is this happening to me? There was a moment when that thing was bigger than God. What, what that situation was, was up here. And I took my eyes off God because I was so upset and so hurt, but I didn't cry. How can I cry when my wife's broken up? How can I cry and, and not be okay when she's okay? And I just wanted her to get over it and be okay. And so for about six months, I didn't cry. And then, uh, and then I got real frustrated at work. One of my friends got elevated. I didn't get elevated. Well, why not me? And I'm, I'm doing things for this guy. You might know this name. His name's Alex Delgado. So I'm doing things for him. I'm going into schools and talking to students. And I'm doing outreach. And I'm working my butt off at Teen Challenge. 
and we have a miscarriage. All this stuff, and I'm just frustrated. And so I'm getting ready to quit Teen Challenge. I'm going to walk away. And so I tell Alex, I need to talk to you. So I tell him everything that I'm feeling, and I'm about to walk away. Something's got to change. you got to find another guy. And he starts laughing. And he says, I just typed up this job title. And he reads me this job title about a guy who does outreach prevention, who works remotely, who can be, make his own schedule and lead people and build people up and do all this stuff that an executive pastor would do. And I'm like, that sounds, sounds really cool. And he says, it's for you. And I said, okay. So God always answers me. Not when I'm at my best and I'm ready for him to answer me. God always does it when I lay everything down. So I accepted the job. This was in October. And then two months later, right before Christmas, we find out that we're pregnant again. And so, so that, finding out that we're pregnant was the greatest feeling in the world followed by the scariest feeling in the world. Because what if it happens again? And so the whole time through my wife's pregnancy, God was walking me through trusting him. Like really trusting him. You know, and now today, my son's two months old. I got my wife. I got my family around me. And I know that this next season, it's going to be good, but it's going to be trying. But I also know that in this season, there's some stuff that I got to lay it down. I have to lay it all down. Because God's going to bring me back to the season again if I don't. I can't get from here to there unless I go through this season. And so I uh, just, just want to thank you guys for letting me share my testimony.